Welcome to our lecture on apoptosis. Here we will learn about the two major pathways of programmed cell death through apoptosis. There are two main types of cell death, apoptosis and necrosis. Apoptosis is usually part of a regulated process and is being called programmed cell death or cell suicide. It is a carefully regulated event requiring energy from the dying cell, usually resulting in cell shrinkage and fragmentation. Phagocytosis of the resultant apoptotic bodies ensures that there is no associated inflammation and bystander tissue damage. Necrosis typically results from significant cellular injury, cells swell and burst releasing intracellular contents in an uncontrolled manner. This causes inflammation and tissue damage. Apoptosis is used for many purposes. During the development of embryos, organs are shaped by building oversized structures and then pruning back the cells that aren't needed. For instance, during development of the nervous system, half of the neurons die, leaving the proper neural wiring. If you have watched a tadpole lose its tail, you have also seen apoptosis in action. When you are an adult, apoptosis continues its work as obsolete cells die and are replaced by new ones, particularly in organs with high turnover, such as the bone marrow and intestines. Apoptosis protects us from cells damaged by radiation or infected by viruses. When detected, these rogue cells are told promptly to commit suicide. Apoptosis is also one of our major defenses against cancer, and deadly cancer cells often have mutations that disable their own apoptosis machinery. This image shows the effect of lack of programmed cell death, specifically apoptosis, on the toes of a human. A mutation has caused the middle two toes to remain connected. So in development, much of who we are and who we become is because of what was purposefully lost and removed. As we have seen many times throughout this term, evolution continues to be this convoluted path that adds one structure only to remove it later in the final product. Blebbing is one of the defined features of apoptosis. During apoptosis, or programmed cell death, the cell's cytoskeleton breaks up and causes the membrane to bulge outward. The bulges separate from the cell, taking a portion of cytoplasm with them to become known as apoptotic blebs. Phagocytic cells eventually consume these fragments and the components are recycled. Two types of blebs are recognized in apoptosis. Initially, small surface blebs are formed. During later stages, larger so-called dynamic blebs may appear, which carry larger organelle fragments, such as larger parts of the fragmented apoptotic cell nucleus. Another key feature of the apoptotic cascade is that DNA of apoptotic cells is cleaved in a uniform manner between histones to create a ladder when separated on agarose gel. In contrast, the DNA is cleaved haphazardly during necrosis, providing a smear. Overall, apoptosis is an orderly process of cellular destruction. A time-lapse series using digital holographic microscopy is presented as a movie. The movie shows living human prostate cancer cells, DU145, induced to undergo apoptosis following treatment with etoposide, a cancer treatment. The images were created by Phase Holographic Imaging, AB, in Lund, Sweden. Notice that when a cell is about to undergo apoptosis, that it appears to implode on itself. and then break apart into smaller blebs. 
In this video, there are no phagocytes in the culture to come and remove the apoptotic cells. There are two major apoptotic signaling pathways, the extrinsic pathway and the mitochondrial intrinsic pathway. In the next few slides, we will look more closely at the mechanisms of each of these pathways that lead to cell suicide. Note that both pathways end up activating a series of proteins called caspases. Caspases are the executioners of apoptosis. Once activated by gatekeeper molecules such as apoptosomes, they chop up strategic proteins in the cell. The name refers to the two properties of these enzymes. First, they are cysteine proteases. They use a sulfur atom in the cysteine to perform the cleavage reaction, the C in caspases. Second, they cut proteins next to aspartate amino acids in their chains, the ASP in caspases. They do not cut indiscriminately. Instead, they are designed to make exactly the right cuts needed to disassemble the cell in an orderly manner. Almost a dozen caspases have been discovered in human cells, each with a slightly different task. Caspase 1, also known as interleukin-1 beta-converting enzyme, was the first one discovered. It is not involved directly in apoptosis, but instead processes a cell signaling molecule in white blood cells. Caspase 9 is an initiator caspase one that begins the process of apoptosis. It receives the message to begin work, becomes activated, and then makes a cut in the effector caspases, such as caspase 3. The effector caspases are also known as the executioners within the apoptotic pathway that mediate the disassembly of the cell. Here is a table of some of the common caspase enzymes involved in the apoptotic cascade. Caspase 9 is predominantly involved with the intrinsic apoptotic cascade, whereas caspases 2 and 8 are predominantly extrinsic initiators. As you might imagine, caspases are dangerous enzymes to have around, so they are created in the form of inactive proenzymes or zymogens. The structure on the left shows one example, procaspase 7. The active site contains a reactive cysteine and two basic and one acidic amino acids, two arginines and one glutamate, shown in blue, that recognize the aspartate in the protein that is cleaved. As you can see, the procaspase is floppy and these four key amino acids are not assembled into a tight active site. When caspase is activated by making a few strategic cuts in the protein chain, the active site can form the proper conformation. The structure on the right shows active caspase 7 with the short protein chain bound in the active site. The structure catches the enzyme in the middle of its reaction. The cysteine is bound to the target protein chain and the aspartate is nestled inside the basic amino acids. The mitochondrial intrinsic pathway is regulated by the BCL2 family of proteins. The BCL2 family consists of over 25 related proteins that share BCL2 homology, BH, domains. The BCL2 family proteins consist of members that either promote or inhibit apoptosis. The intrinsic apoptotic pathway can be activated by internal cellular damage and stress, including treatment with DNA damaging agents, such as the cancer drug etoposide that was shown on the previous video to cause the apoptosis of prostate cancer cells. They control apoptosis by governing the process of mitochondrial outer membrane permeabilization, or MOMP, which is a key step in the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis. BCL2 family proteins have a general structure that consists of a hydrophobic alpha helix, 
surrounded by amphipathic alpha helices. Some members of the family have a transmembrane sequence at their C terminus, which primarily function to localize them to the mitochondrion. As noted on the previous slide, the members of the BCL2 family share one or more of the four characteristic domains of homology, entitled BCL2 homology, or BH domains, named BH1, BH2, BH3, and BH4. The BH domains are known to be crucial for function. The anti-apoptotic BCL2 proteins, such as BCL2 and BCLXL, tend to conserve all four BH domains. The BH domains also serve to subdivide the pro-apoptotic BCL2 proteins into those with several BH domains, like BAX and BAC, or those proteins that only have BH3 domains. After apoptotic stimuli, BH3-only proteins activate BCL2-associated X protein, BAX, and BCL2 homologist antagonist killer, BAC, which undergoes conformational change and inserts into the mitochondrial outer membrane. BAC and BAX oligomerize to form pores releasing cytochrome C from the inner membrane space into the cytosol. When cells are not undergoing apoptosis, the anti-apoptotic BCL2 members prevent mitochondrial outer membrane permeabilization by sequestering BH3-only proteins or by inhibiting the BAC's BAC oligomerization. The release of cytochrome C from the mitochondria shown in red, causes the assembly of a structure known as the apoptosome. In the cytosol, cytochrome C binds to the protein APAF1, shown in blue and purple, causing it to assemble in a seven-fold ring. The caspases are then activated by binding to a ring of card domains, shown in purple on the left or blue on the right on the assembled apoptosome. Apoptosome assembly is completed by the association and activation of procaspase 9. Procaspase has a card domain that allows assembly with the apoptosome and recruits the binding of a second apoptosome wheel unit. This results in the cleavage and activation of caspase 9. Active caspase 9 cleaves and activates downstream effector caspases responsible for the disassembly of the cellular components. Caspases are designed to break proteins into bite-sized pieces, but the cell needs help to break down its other molecules. Cells also have a number of caspase-activated proteins to do this work. The one shown here is a caspase-activated deoxyribonuclease. During apoptosis, the caspase breaks up an inhibitory protein that binds to the two large domains at the bottom, creating the active form. DNA slides into the large group at the top, and the active site amino acids, shown here in green, clip it into small pieces. The extrinsic apoptotic pathway is initiated is initiated by external ligands that bind with protein death receptors on the surface of the cell, such as FAS and tumor necrosis factor receptor, TNFR. Once the receptor is bound, FAS oligomerizes to form the death-inducing signaling complex, DISC. Formation of the DISC complex leads to the cleavage and activation of procaspase 2 and procaspase 8. Activated caspase 2 and caspase 8 can mobilize effector caspases directly and can also activate the mitochondrial apoptotic cascade as well. Apoptosis does not lead to inflammation in surrounding tissue, meaning there is no bystander tissue damage. To achieve this, cells undergoing apoptosis release soluble factors, such as nucleotides, 
ATP and UTP, and chemokines, CX3, CL1, that recruit phagocytes. Recruited phagocytes recognize apoptotic cells by the presence of eatme molecules, such as phosphatidylserine, present on their surface. The phagocyte responds to these signals by engulfing the apoptotic cell or body. Degradation of the engulfed component completes the process.